Good evening, colleagues. This is my pleasure and I'm honored to respect our guest today, Mr. Richard Pirabusian, who came especially today for our event from year one. I'm very grateful for that. It's the second time we're hosting the lecture by Mr. Pirabusian. I think it needs to be uh, too many words to say to represent Mr. Pirabusian. I think everyone knows him as a expert who works on economic and political issues, not only about Armenia, but also for large-scale context, like South Caucasus, Middle East, and Asia. Um, he's the director at the Regional Studies Center, and he regularly observes ongoing political developments in the region, in Armenia, first of all, and gives his expertise for many international organizations. I will not take too long time, but I will ask those who need some translation to take devices behind the table. And uh, in case if you ask questions in Georgian or English, please take the microphone, not because of the reason that we do not hear your voice, but because of the reason that the event is translated and translator needs to hear your voice. Also, while asking questions, I would ask you to present yourself. Now I will give the floor to Mr. Virabosian. The floor is yours, and you are the only man on the floor. So it's up to you to moderate the event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on a Thursday evening. We will try to actually make this a little more interactive. And focus on the broader regional implications beyond simply looking at Armenia. But, as you know, the title or theme of tonight's presentation is Armenia's Eurasian Choice. Sad to say, Armenia is now a member of the Eurasian Union. And, in many ways, it marks a new dividing line in this already conflict-prone region of the South Caucasus where Georgia, much to its credit, was able to sign an association agreement with the European Union, with a real test coming in terms of implementation. Armenia, unfortunately, has gone in the opposite direction in terms of a retreat into Putin's pet project of the Eurasian Union. But in many ways, the title tonight, Armenia's Eurasian Choice, is really reflecting the fact that Armenia has had little choice, largely due to, to its own shortcomings, its own strategic opportunities and choices have been severely limited. The second name or official designation of tonight's presentation is how democracy should develop further. To be honest, I don't have that answer. And to be honest, if I did have the answer of how to actually achieve democracy in this region, I would probably be sitting in a government ministry, probably not in Azerbaijan, not in Armenia, but probably in Tbilisi. But to be honest, it's also a question of how to pressure, how to invoke a degree of accountability that has been missing. and. We must note that in many ways, Georgia has regained its position as the leader of this region in terms of moving much closer and much faster to the European Union. But I do want to focus on three specific issues tonight. The first, besides answering the war, is looking at broader trends in terms of the deeper dynamic in this region. And then talking more about recent developments, recent in terms of since the beginning of this year. And third, looking at domestic politics in Armenia, but in terms of what lessons, in terms of differences and similarities Armenia shares with Georgia, in terms of at times dysfunctional politics, or in the Georgian case, and more recently in the Armenian case, vendetta politics, 
But first, in terms of broader trends, I do want to specifically highlight four specific broader trends. The first is, of course, political. In our media, which is still a step behind Georgia's development in political culture, where Georgia achieved a significant, important political precedent that is underestimated. It was the peaceful transfer of power from a government to an opposition. I'm, to be honest, I'm no fan of your prime minister, nor of an oligarch in politics in any country. Yet, this precedent in Georgian politics was especially important. In terms of Armenian political developments, the underlying problem, I would argue, is that there is no real opposition in Armenia. The largely discredited old opposition forces or parties in Armenia simply want to attain power. The government of Armenia, naturally, simply wants to hold power. In other words, in Armenia, the opposition is very good at opposing, but very bad at proposing. What they like to do is to criticize any sitting government, not for the sake of policy changes, but for the sake of criticism. In other words, it's fairly easy, but it's a degree of political laziness and complacency to simply criticize the government for everything, from a thunderstorm to a policy mistake without offering a viable alternative policy. In Armenia as well, we see politics like Georgia dominated more by personalities, not policies. In effect, sadly, much of the South Caucasus is marked by a selection instead of an election of various political personalities with little policy platform and even less ideology. The citizens of Armenia and for a long time the citizens of Georgia were routinely denied a voice and denied a choice in politics in their countries. The second broader trend, however, is the military security situation where the region is still struggling with both the legacy of unresolved conflicts, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, but also 2008 and the Russian invasion. Armenia as well struggles with the burden of the unresolved Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. What's sad and an indictment of the leaderships of all the countries in the region is that these small, frozen conflicts have become powerful impediments and burden to the development of each country and the development of the region. In many ways, the militant voices have crowded out or marginalized the moderate voices in each of our societies. But in terms of military security, we have a new dimension of threat. And let's be honest, it's coming from the north, it's post-Crimea, it's eastern Ukraine, it's the fact that Russia has changed the game. And in fact, according to the new geopolitical rules, it's much more 19th century and much less 21st century. In fact, President Putin in Moscow has taught us all an important lesson that our version of a rational actor and a cost-benefit analysis no longer applies to analyzing or predicting Russian behavior. It's, no new, it's nothing new to the Georgian population, obviously, but it should be a warning to the Armenian population in terms of its over-dependence on Russia. The third broader trend that's important, or probably even more important, is the economic. To be honest, it is the economic weakness, vulnerability, and lack of sustainable reform in all the countries of the South Caucasus that is the more powerful challenge to the leaderships.
In the Armenian context, it's the economic challenge that means that one out of every three people living in Armenia lives in poverty. It also means in Georgia, there is a widening disparity, not just in wealth and income, but in terms of the rural population versus the urban population in Georgia. What it also means in terms of economic weakness and fragility is Armenia, even more than Georgia, but also Georgia, pays a price in terms of the spillover from Russia in the north. In Armenia, it's a decrease in remittances, but whether it's a global economic crisis or a regional one, it's a challenge also for the Georgian government in terms of economic reform. And in the Georgian context, the real challenge, I think, was not in negotiating and signing the association agreement with the EU. The real challenge is implementing, implementation and implementing the association agreement. And that's where Russia will wait to try to destabilize Georgia and to target Georgia. The fourth broader trend is the diplomatic, or I should say, the rather primitive level of diplomacy in all of our countries, where most of our leaders, and sadly, including Georgia, much of the political leadership tend to govern the country based more on self-interest rather than national interest. This is a fundamental shortcoming. It also presents a paradox politically, a paradox where Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan are still relatively newcomers to post-Soviet independence. It's been over 20 years, it's been two decades, it's not that long of a time frame in terms of history. But the paradox is that being over 20 years old means that the excuse of adolescence, the excuse of being an infant democracy, no longer should be tolerated. Shortcomings and deficiencies in democracy can no longer be excused by the fact that we weren't prepared for democracy. We're, we're still working at democratic reform. The leaders need to be held more accountable to the basic delivering of services to the population. But if we look at the recent developments, I would identify three specific recent developments that are each directly applicable and significant for Georgia. And in fact, for too long, there's been a degree of analytical laziness in Georgia, ignoring bigger trends, ignoring the dangers and the opportunities of developments in the broader region. For too long, the Armenians, the Georgians, have become too used to missed opportunities rather than seizing the initiative. The first recent development is specifically important given the nature of Armenian-Russian relations, which is now changing. Those of us who worry about Armenia's dangerous over-dependence on Russia and also are concerned about Armenia being manipulated by Moscow to target Georgia. What's interesting is the Armenian-Russian relationship is still fairly fundamental. It's not easy to challenge the bilateral relationship. What is changing, however, is a new degree of challenge and questioning of the terms of the relationship between Armenia and Russia, the asymmetry, and more specifically, the lack of respect that Russia treats Armenia as taking for granted Armenia's subordination, if you will. What we also see is a deeper trend that's even more important, and that is Armenia is still profoundly pro-Russian but it's much less pro-Putin. And there's an important difference between relying on Russia or exaggerating 
a belief that Russia will protect Armenia, that's vastly different than pro-Putin policy positions. And the reason this is important is because over the New Year holiday, there was a tragedy in Armenia where a rogue Russian soldier deserted his post at the Russian base in Armenia, armed, he killed or massacred, if you will, an entire Armenian family. The tragedy itself would not be enough to trigger such a reaction or a problem. What triggered the crisis was the mishandling of that tragedy. The Armenian government, like the Russian soldier, also deserted its post. The Armenian president was so fearful of Moscow that they didn't even issue a statement. They didn't even handle the crisis. The Russian position was, no surprise, typically arrogant in terms of dictating the terms of how the crisis would be played out. The compromise that was reached was that the Russian soldier will be put on trial in Armenia, but in a Russian military court, and then will be immediately flown to Russia and will serve his sentence in a Russian military prison facility. But what's also important is the protests, the demonstrations that were held against the Russian military base and against the Russian consulate in Gumri, Armenia's second largest city. What was most interesting was a large proportion of those Armenian demonstrators protesting against Russia had just come home to Armenia from their jobs and their homes in Krasnodar, in Moscow, in Rostov. In fact, they were in Armenia for a very sad New Year's celebration because they lost their jobs in the Russian construction sector. Many of these Armenian demonstrators were not going back to Russia. Even more heated, even more vocal in protesting conditions. What's also important is this transformation or challenge to Armenian-Russian relations is also important for Armenian-Georgian relations. Because in the broader perspective, as Georgia signed the association agreement and Armenia was forced to join the Eurasian Union, this created yet another dividing line in the region, but it also increased the importance of deepening Armenian-Georgian relations. To be honest, former Defense Minister Irak Alasanya and his Armenian counterpart were working very hard to prevent Russia from using Armenia or the Russian base in Armenia against Georgia. More specifically, we see a new provocation coming Samske Javaketi, as well as Russian attempts to poison Georgian-Armenian relations, and most recently through the allegation and accusation about Armenian churches in Georgia. This was very much a Russian orchestrated provocation, and it also shows the danger that a lack of deep, stable, and rather predictable bilateral relations between Armenia and Georgia makes us both more vulnerable and susceptible to Russian manipulation. What we also see is previous Russian attempts to destabilize the previous Georgian government focused on Samske Javaketi in terms of arguing that Thousands of Meshketian Turks would be coming and the Armenians in Samske Javaketi are under threat. This didn't work under the Saakashvili government. First, because the Georgian government at the time was prudent enough to actually see Samske Javaketi as important in terms of the need to integrate the Armenians there, not to exclude. In other words, to be delicate in handling 
the crisis of identity, the lack of language, and the lack of economic opportunity. The local Armenians in Samske Jalaketi didn't fall for the provocation, mainly because there's a sense of betrayal that the largest employer in Samske Jalaketi used to be the Russian military base. Many of the Armenians there felt betrayed by the Russian withdrawal. A second provocation is now being planned where Russia is trying to incite new tension, not between the Armenians in Samske Jalaketi and Tbilisi, rather to incite intercommunal tension between the ethnic Azerbaijanis and the ethnic Armenians. It probably will not work, but it does remind us of the need to devote more attention to deepening the bilateral relations between Yerevan and Tbilisi. Now, the second recent development that's especially important for Georgia is a new, perhaps risky move by Putin in terms of changing Russian policy regarding Nagorno-Karabakh. In other words, for many years, Russia benefits the most from manipulating the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and from the status quo, neither peace nor war. In fact, Russia is the number one arms provider, not only to Armenia, but also to Azerbaijan at the same time. But, to be honest, some of the crazy people around Putin advising him on Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, seem to be now tempted to inject a new level of risk. Specifically, what they're arguing is looking at Abkhazia and South Ossetia before 2008, where the Russians are saying the leverage and power that Russia had in South Ossetia and Abkhazia were based on two instruments, Russian passports, therefore Russian citizens to protect, and Russian peacekeepers, neither of which they have in Nagorno-Karabakh. And there's perhaps a new risky temptation to provoke or promote military hostilities and tension over Nagorno-Karabakh to give them that added insurance, to give Russia greater leverage, perhaps most appropriately, arguing for Russian peacekeepers. As we all know from South Ossetia and Abkhazia, first of all, Russian peacekeepers, once they're deployed, never leave. And there's really no peace to keep for Russian peacekeepers. But it does bear greater scrutiny by the Georgian government. The third recent development is the one rare element of good news, and that is Armenia, once again, is emulating Georgia, is looking to Georgia with hope in terms of bridging us to the European Union. In other words, despite the fact that we're in the Eurasian Union prison, we are at the same time working on a new draft legal framework between Armenia and the European Union designed to salvage and save the relationship. For the Armenian government, the motivation is, is sincere, but driven by the need to garner greater legitimacy and the need to at least appear more balanced, as well as the need to offset the economic cost and liability <coughs> of the Eurasian Union. What this also means in terms of the broader Western policy of engagement, the U.S. under the Obama administration has adopted a more prudent policy, specifically toward Armenia, where they're much less willing to give up Armenia to Russia and much more willing to plant the flag and not give up without a fight. There is a significant U.S. investment now in Armenia's energy sector specifically decided, since Russia owns much of the energy sector, this is clearly a message to Moscow as well. But turning to domestic politics, 
More recently, we had a development in Armenia this past month where the second largest party of Armenia, Prosperous Armenia, which was a party led by a very prominent and very primitive oligarch, businessman, a former arm wrestler. What this represents is the worst of a Berlusconi style marriage of business and politics. And after a long period of pretending to be an opposition force, they actually came to directly confront and challenge the Armenian president. The Armenian president responded with his own personal Georgian style vendetta in terms of forcing the resignation and greatly neutralizing this second political party. What's interesting is the tipping point, why and how this happened. The real trigger for this crisis was the fact that the leader of the second largest party, with the assistance of Armenia's former president, Robert Kocharyan, went to Moscow and tried to secure Russian support, arguing that the current Armenian government is no longer reliable for Moscow, arguing that they should enjoy Russian support. This, of course, was the tipping point, the trigger for this confrontation. As the second largest party has now been effectively neutralized, the implications are dangerous for political development. I'm no fan of that prosperous Armenia party, but it is a blow to democracy because it only consolidates one party rule in Armenia. And the ruling Republican Party will gain even more power in the wake of the loss of a rival. At the same time, the opposition in Armenia is significantly discredited. Much of the opposition were so desperate that, that they were flirting with Moscow, adopting a pro-Russian agenda simply out of desperation. Unfortunately, the demise of the old discredited opposition has left a vacuum. The good news is that <coughs> Armenia is undergoing a political transition. And in many ways, it's really best to apply literature to understand Armenian politics. Because the current Armenian president is the last of the Mohicans, the last of a specific political elite from Nagorno-Karabakh, and that came to power because of Nagorno-Karabakh. After President Sarkisyan, there is no clear successor representing the same political lineage. It's the last of the Mohicans. At the same time, it's also Moby Dick. Former President Robert Kocharya represents the Moby Dick of Armenian politics, where everyone's looking, where is the former president? What is he doing? What is he saying? Behind the scenes, eminent Greece, in terms of posing a hidden or obscure challenge to democracy. The reason we fall into this trap is the lack of real choices. It's even fewer strong personalities with no real or clear policy proposals or alternatives. But the reason I'm optimistic is because the political transition in Armenia has begun. Politically, the lack of legitimacy is an inherent weakness and to be honest, the Armenian government is perhaps the most unpopular in Armenian political history, and it is now the most or the weakest in Armenian political history, given the economic fragility. What this means for the transition is that it is now clear the closed, rigid political system can no longer sustain itself. It will be forced open, with a more level playing field, allowing for the emergence of a new opposition force in Armenia. And there is a new opposition force now 
taking shape in Armenia. And what's interesting about this new force is it represents a model that has never been tried before in Armenia or the Caucasus. In other words, it's not a strong personality coming and forming a political party. Rather, this is a force that is forming a platform, an ideology, and then a political party, which will then produce and offer its own candidates. In other words, it's a Western-style party, grassroots, bottom-up alternative. And with parliamentary elections in 2017 and presidential elections in 2018, there's enough time for this emerging opposition force to actually offer a fresh alternative and in become an agent of change and a catalyst of development. <coughs> now, the government will begin to accelerate in Armenia a defensive reaction in terms of consolidating its own one-party rule and speed up the process of constitutional amendments trying to change Armenia from a presidential to a parliamentary form of government. It's not often that Armenia likes to imitate Georgia, but in a negative trend, we may follow the negative example of Georgia in terms of the parliamentary system of government. I'm a little too honest, perhaps. I'm not a big fan of the prime minister. And I do think the president of Georgia deserves a little more respect and a little more power. But the deeper problem is actually a shared affliction. The fundamental weakness in Georgia and Armenia is actually the relationship between business and politics, between wealth and leadership. We don't have to name names, but in other words, it should no longer be acceptable simply to become the bankomat, the ATM of a country, in terms of dispersing dividends to the population. Rather, the leadership of these countries should actually serve the population. The population has been serving the leadership for too long. And what we need to do is to challenge and hold more accountable our leaders. Now, in conclusion, what's most important is to admit that there is no conclusion. This is a dynamic, not a static process. To be honest, the future of Georgia, the future of Armenia, is even more now in question than it once ever was. In other words, Georgia graduated from what many Americans would define as a failed state. Georgia overcame civil wars and the burden of real conflict. Armenia actually survived its own challenges. Terrorism with an attack on parliament, a constitutional crisis when the first president was forced to resign, but the institutions in our countries are far too weak. Individuals matter too much. No offense, even Mr. Alessania, it was too much of an individual, not enough of an institution. This is what we need to strengthen. One lesson from the Saakashvili government, to be fair, is that if we look at Saakashvili, individual Democrats are very important, are very necessary, but democratic institutions are more important and more durable than individual Democrats. Now, let me stop here and make it more of an interactive discussion. And we can also go into more depth into any of the issues or trends we've covered. Mr. Uh, should I use the microphone? Or? Oh, if you can identify yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Arsen Karatian. Um, currently based in Tbilisi, um, doing journalism and involved in a political movement in Armenia called Civic Contract. 
Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, it is not often that we have uh, a, a somewhat of a, a different, uh, a, in a positive way, approach on presenting the situation in Armenia, particularly here in Georgia, and I find it a, a very important thing to do. Uh, there are stereotypes in general that often run uh, ideas and, and, and thoughts about our political environment. Now, um, I would like to make two remarks on with regards to the Georgian-Armenian issues, not Georgia-Armenia, two separate issues. Uh, number one is uh, about the passport situation in San Sergei You mentioned that you view uh, that and the, the church dispute as a Russian provocation. Um, I would like to disagree with that, uh, actually viewing it uh, more of a competency issue uh, locally in San Sergei on the one hand, possibly, and uh, a provocation from within the existing Georgian institutions, uh, possibly with the previous administration's leftover people trying to show a negative side of the current government. I didn't know there were leftover people. Oh yeah, uh, on, on middle level and upper middle level. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes in the internal ministry of Georgia and different other institutions recently. But, uh, but what, what, what makes me say this is also a specific program, a Sunday program that was read about this issue where they portrayed the local Armenian community as basically Russian spies. And uh, there was actually a tiny little kid playing with a gun on which there was a camera shot for about 10 seconds. So stuff like this happened in Georgia, not necessarily only with the Russian provocation. And I'm not a great fan of Mr. Putin or Moscow's policy in this region. And number two, about the church situation, uh, it was immediately uh, distributed that all well, Armenians in Georgia are now asking for this many territories. The reality of the matter is that the Georgian institution for religious affairs was only established last year, the government institution. The government institution asked the Armenian Diocese of Georgia to provide with whatever they're asking in general, because you know the church and no other institution in this country except for the Georgian Orthodox Church have a status, a legal status. So there are two NGOs that basically are the legal status of the Armenian church and other institutions here. And so the Armenian church came up with its list of things, and that's another issue. But what I'm saying is this was a normal process from within Georgia rather than an externally provoked situation. And these are things that I, would, I wouldn't notice being in Armenia, but as I'm living here now, it's a little bit more clear. Now, with regards to internal developments, I think you have a very, very good and clear presentation of what's happening in Armenia, and I'd like to ask you about possible prospects. Now, um, as you said, there is a vacuum for opposition, and this was cleared by basically eliminating, using state terror by the kleptocratic regime of Armenia, uh, taking out uh, the oligarch in, from the politics in general. What we have been witnessing is an interesting development with Ruben Bartanya, another Russia-based Armenian oligarch, who is actually getting involved into the pan-Armenian discussion quite uh, rapidly, and as you saw maybe yesterday, he was talking with George Clooney in New York on the centenary of the Armenian Genocide, and he has this big project. And uh, as well as actually uh, uh, invested about $3 million here to reconstruct an Armenian church of 13th century. These are things that are not PR yet, but I have a feeling that he is collecting the team uh, to actually at some point get into politics. Do you see him coming into politics? And if so, uh, a, a line can be drawn between him and Ivan Ishvili. Like Ivan Ishvili, he made his fortune outside of Armenia and uh, now has been investing heavily in uh, philanthropist politics, as we all know, but as a philanthropist has been investing heavily. Do you see this happening and can there be a scenario that Georgia had, which was constitutional reform to go into parliamentary state, and then at some point an oligarch coming with money with a team, better around, and then possibly changing this. Do you see this happening? <coughs> uh, excuse me for being too long. Uh, thank you for the clarifications and the corrections, to be honest. But to address the question, I would see two scenarios. Um, first, the least likely, is this what we call Spitak Aspet, this white knight political model. Someone coming in from the outside, rescuing Messiah arising, rescuing the nation, uh, financed usually based on personal wealth in some cases. Uh, this is uh, a real development in terms of 
the politicization or the instrumentalization of a Moscow-based ethnic Armenian businessman who is now engaged directly in domestic politics in Armenia, uh, beyond philanthropy but political activity. I don't think it will work. I don't also think the plan is for him to be a candidate. I think rather he and his team are necessary to strengthen the weakening system. So in other words, it's to shore up and to consolidate the power and position of the likely successor rather than coming and moving into Armenia from abroad. The second scenario is probably more likely. There's one interesting figure who appears to be being groomed to take over as the president of Armenia. It's Armenia's current defense minister. Um, whether this plays out, we don't yet know. Because the current Armenian president is being very careful at not choosing or anointing his successor too early. At the same time, uh, the defense minister may be a compromise acceptable candidate to both Kocharyan and Sarxian. Uh, personally, I like the Armenian defense minister. He's committed to reform. Um, he's the rare exception of being professional military and not a politician nor a businessman. But the problem in Armenia like Georgia is We've gone beyond one person making or breaking a nation. The problem and the solution to the political challenges in Armenia and Georgia are systemic, not individual. In other words, let's be honest, if Jesus Christ was the president of either of our countries, our problems would not be solved overnight. He may turn the other cheek, he may absolve sins, but the problem is systemic and it requires more than one hero or one savior at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Guy Edmonds. Um, I just had a quick question about the um, opposition force that you mentioned that's forming. Could you elaborate more? Who are they? How widespread is support for them? Um, and why are you so confident that they will be able to flourish? Or is there a danger of the, the government really trying to crack down or make life harder for them? Thank you. A very good question. When I was talking about this new emerging political force in Armenia, which is not yet a political party, this civic contract, what appeals to me first is beyond the model of forming a policy platform first, not a personality or a candidate first. What also appeals to me is it's a very diverse group in terms of gender, in terms of age, in terms of political persuasion. They're committed to probably only one or two things in common a shared vision of democracy and a shared commitment to Armenia. Whereas there are different civic activists, different professionals, most impressively in Armenia, like Georgia, there's gender balance, which is all but missing. At the same time, it's a refreshing offer beyond the Soviet generation. These are also including young leaders who emerged in difficult conditions that are products of independent Armenia, not former Soviet trained or educated. Now, I'm optimistic because the playing field is opening and because the existing opposition is so largely discredited, coupled with the fact that the Armenian population is much less apathetic and in fact, it's the economic crisis in Armenia that's more key to political frustration. The Armenian government is much weaker. It's the weakest government to date in Armenia. Moreover, the lack of legitimacy, popular support, would make any kind of repression 
or cracked down by the Armenian government counterproductive. In other words, the real tipping point for political change may be in the hands of the government itself in terms of overreacting. And Armenia is a very different place than it once was. It's much less a country of sheep as it once was. Just as Georgia is very different than it once was. And the standards, expectations, are higher in both countries. And it's also a refreshing demographic shift where the real people who count in Georgia and Armenia are people of the age sitting in this room. You are the future of your country. You are the tomorrow of your countries. It's not your parents' generation. It's not my generation. In fact, in many ways, the existing political elites are actually in decline. They're the last to realize it as well. And there is a, a generational paradigm shift coming. So I'm optimistic about their chances. I'm optimistic about their role with parliamentary elections coming. It's not a guarantee that they'll win, nor is it a guarantee that they will change the system overnight. What is guaranteed, however, is that there is no alternative but reform. Even the most committed authoritarian elements of the Armenian government realize that. The second reason I'm optimistic is the population of Armenia, like Georgia, has gone too far and has tolerated too much to go backwards now. And in fact, in many ways, real political change in Georgia as well as Armenia is rooted in the fact that people are much less willing to tolerate what they once were. In other words, the age of the discredited, incompetent so-called politician has passed. Um, and to be honest, it's a bigger trend. In other words, even if we look at Putin, even if we look at the Russian model, it's a position of weakness, not strength. And in many ways, Georgia is passed through an important threshold with the precedent, precedent of a peaceful transfer of power, although tainted by a rather vindictive crackdown, if you will. But even in Georgia, there's an appetite or a desire for more change, not less, and certainly not even status quo. At the same time, there's also a need for real political parties, grassroots-based, policy-driven, and much less largely discredited personalities. Are you going to ask in Georgian? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me put my headphones on. <laughs> what channel is the translation, guys? Paris, please. Romania. Which channel? Sorry. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Oh, I'm punished. Yeah. <laughs> Can I continue? Why don't you just continue in Georgian and someone will translate for me? Can anyone step up for translation? I'd love to if my Georgian was Oh, here we go. Oh, thank you. Um. <laughs>
تیت کارتول پشیت کی تا کسای که دوست مکالمه کردشی رومیل تریا کارتولی آنو شدیس دارن داری چیف دبای ریگیونالوری پلیتیست استورات آماده و دست استورات این دموکراتیون استیتوت بیس گاندی تریا بار از کنن پتاند آگ دارن میگیم میشنو باس این مسیر مسخره و باس کارتول بساز داره کارتول بساز آرایت مالی مکالمه کردی تیشه نبا آنو اتی بود آنو ما رو باس اوبروکی میشود و سعی کنیم راشیت یورا تسبا از سیدو بیلیس مسکوات ایلمنت ابیداخ تبا اتیم کوریدا شیت ایتیم کوری اگر پروبلم بیش کاری داد ما دو تولیشی کامی داره سیدو Because I know so little about the complexity of Abkhazia, Soto Setia, it's actually rewarding to hear deeper analysis. And there are actually two specific points that you made that I want to highlight. The first is your analysis is very correct and realistic when looking at Russia. Because what Putin is engaged in is not recreating the Soviet Union. It's rather Russian Empire, Tsarist policy, divide and rule, divide and conquer, and it's exacerbating our own internal weakness. The second important point regarding civic uh, feeling, as you said it, uh, is a core identity issue where identity needs to be better addressed in terms of identity problems, whether it's Armenia, Turkey, or whether it's this case. And what's interesting is, I, I moved to Armenia nine years ago from Washington. I used to be in the American government. And when I was in the US government, I had two Georgians visit me. One I liked, and one I didn't like. The one I liked was Zorab Zvania. The one I didn't like was Nino Borjanatri, to be honest. But what we were doing at the time was looking at Abkhazia and Soto Setia in terms of how could the Georgian side come up with an incentive-based policy to attract, to bring back, reintegrate Abkhazia and Soto Setia. Because the real challenge for Georgia tomorrow is what to do with the situation in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. On the one hand, it's really <coughs> counterproductive. It really didn't work that six countries around the world were paid, pressured, or persuaded to recognize the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. I mean, let's be honest, I'm against the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. It's not a viable state. But what this means for Georgia, how to reintegrate national territory. And I don't share the Azerbaijani obsession with territorial integrity, especially given the post-Soviet legacy from seven decades of Soviet playing with borders, ethnicities, etc. But the real lesson learned is how to deal with the challenge of identity, conflicting identity, in politics. The best way to do it is focusing more on economic development and opportunity. The more of a middle class that emerges, the deeper democracy becomes. The more economic opportunity and prosperity, the less important that the Mingrelians fight with the Georgians, etc. But the real lesson is that we are all vulnerable to geopolitical interference. Much larger regional powers, Turkey, Iran, Russia, throughout our history, the Persians, the Russian Empire, etc. The real answer to limiting and containing and constraining the external manipulation is domestic. The deeper our democracy is, the more durable our economic is, economies are, 
This is the way to defend against external interference. In other words, it's fascinating, it's sexy to talk about geopolitics. But it's really not about geopolitics. The answer is local economics and local politics, much more than Georgia is going to be the NATO member, and etc. That's not the answer, guys. It's more local and much less geopolitical. The other problem is the reality of geography. Whether we like it or not, we live next door to Turkey and Azerbaijan. We have to engage. There's no way, there's no way out for Georgia as well. The bigger problem, though, is the South Caucasus, if it ever really existed as a region, is now once again fragmenting. Georgia is moving much faster and much closer to Europe, and it's more than just a flag in front of every building. Azerbaijan, every day, becomes more Central Asian in terms of its energy, in terms of its style of government. Armenia is in danger of being left isolated in whatever remains of this region. And the real threat to us in Armenia is not Turkey or Azerbaijan. <coughs> the real threat is isolation, where closed borders never reopen, and insignificance where no one cares about Armenia anymore, except maybe Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and that's not the kind of image for Armenia we should aspire to. In other words, what this means is, our future is not only a shared past, but a shared future. The only way to resist is collective <coughs> strength. But until we get our own houses in order, then we won't be able to attain that. Other than that, there is no answer yet to your statement, your question, but your analysis is very welcome. Now the translator caught up. You <laughs> must hate me by now. <laughs> yes. Um, I have a question about that. Zamir uh, Abbasova, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. Um, my question would be the opposition um, initiatives that are emerging currently in Armenia. What? Which one? Opposition. Yep. Um, the same tendency was in Azerbaijan as well. Um, unfortunately, the initiative which has started as a civil union um, and later tried to be an organization which the government didn't register, that was a real alternative party. Well, now it is kind of considered to be a party. But um, unfortunately, yeah, the government has seen um, very dynamic activeness and all the um, criteria which you have mentioned about those, uh, like diversity in age, gender, blah, blah, blah. All these kinds of things were present. Um, but currently, all the leaders, um, the board members of the organization, the name of the party, are um, under arrest currently. So what do you think the Armenian initiative, which is emerging currently in Armenia, should do differently in order not to end up just like the real alternatives party in Azerbaijan? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, especially because uh, by circumstance, I've been working for a long time with Eldar and Erkin mm -hmm. from the real movement. Um, and many of our friends are sadly whether it's Khadija, whether it's others, Leila Yunus, Arif Yunusov, are paying a price um, for the reality of today's Azerbaijan domestic. <coughs> now, I hesitated to talk too much about Azerbaijan because even though I'm from Armenia, it's not always helpful to simply beat up Azerbaijan because I'm from Armenia. But I was in Baku in June. And what distressed me and depressed me was the trajectory. Forget Nagorno-Karabakh, put it aside for a moment. If we look at the future development of Azerbaijan, father to son, political dynasty, where we talk about the militants over the moderates, in Azerbaijan it's even worse with Mekdiev and the others. What we also see is the difference between Armenia is Fortunately for us, we have much more space in which to operate. Our government is weak in a different way. The Azerbaijani government, however, 
is actually seriously weak and its own lack of legitimacy is actually promoting a deeper crackdown. Even the Karabakh, even the military strategy is based on domestic politics in Azerbaijan. The problem in Azerbaijan is much worse than Armenia, also because there's no steam valve for dissent. There's no easy way to dissent, to criticize, to oppose. This is actually fueling greater instability within Azerbaijan and giving more credence to Islam in Azerbaijan, as well as internal entrenched corruption. In the Armenian case, I find it odd but refreshing that I think, thank God, we don't have oil. It would be much worse if there was oil or gas in Armenia. I'd rather be resource poor. In Azerbaijan's case, the other problem is it's painted itself so far in a corner that it's hard to climb back down or to escape its own rhetoric. Prisoners of the propaganda is what we see on both sides. But I'll be more honest with you. I've met President Aliyev, both President Aliyevs. I was very impressed when I met President Gaidar Aliyev in Washington. Um, a bit underwhelmed by President Ilham Aliyev. Um, but the other problem is inherently a father-to-son transition. If we look at the one existing closest model of Syria, Assad to Assad, that didn't go too well. And the more authoritarian Azerbaijan moves, the more dangerous that the implications or the instability will be that much more pronounced. Surat Husinov style. The other problem though, let's talk in a broader sense. My criticism of the Armenian side regarding Azerbaijan and the Gorla Karabakh is the fact that we don't do enough to understand that Azerbaijan is justified in its sense of frustration and rage at the lack of progress in the peace process whatsoever. We need to understand that Azerbaijan needs to save face and needs a way, in my opinion, to let go of Nagorno-Karabakh. But that's why the real status issue is over the occupied territories of Azerbaijan. Now, my view is not necessarily popular in Armenia, nor is it enough for the Azerbaijani side. But we need to find a middle, face-saving way out. But the other problem is, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, there is no realistic expectation of progress over Nagorno-Karabakh. The two sides are simply too far apart. Maybe we need to refreeze that conflict and instead focus on democracy in our countries first and only then can we find a way to resolve Nagorno-Karabakh, but not without democracy and not before. And that Key West in 2001, when Gaidar Aliyev and Robert Kocharyan came closest to a peace deal, at the last minute they couldn't deliver, out of fear that they wouldn't be able to survive politically or personally. This is high stakes, but it's also a sad indictment of how far backwards we've gone. The other problem, unlike Armenia, is the price we pay for dissent or opposition is an occasional beating, hospitali hospitalization, yes, unacceptable abuse in behavior, but nowhere near the severity of Azerbaijan where many of our friends are sitting in jail simply because they talk to us and they meet with us. They're not spying for Armenia, it's absurd. And it's show trials, if you will. The other problem is even Turkey's embarrassed by Azerbaijan's behavior, which that's a pretty sad indictment too. But at the same time, things are going to get worse before they get better, I'm afraid. The other final note regarding Azerbaijan is we need a way to strengthen and defend the space in which a healthy dynamic opposition can emerge. But at the same time, 
given the Azerbaijani government's stance and degree of repression, it's going to be uh, it's going to be very violent. It's not going to be a peaceful way out, unfortunately. And as usual, who pays the price, whether it's war or domestic repression? It's the ordinary citizen, sadly. The leaders don't send their sons or daughters to the front line in a political battle or a military conflict. Uh. My name is David Patashvili. I have another follow-up question regarding uh, this new. This uh, I have another question regarding this new Armenian. Okay. Emerging Armenian opposition. Is it uh, right now uh, uh, an activist network, a civic activist network, or does it consciously see itself as a possible future a political force, or I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe presently it does uh, see itself in this way. And the second question is, could you elaborate about uh, the ongoing Russian effort that you have mentioned to uh, promote uh, possible ethnic tension or conflict between Armenians and Azerbaijanis in, inside Georgia, if possible, please. Thank you. Thank you, David, for the questions. Uh, the first question regarding the emerging political force in Armenia. I do want to point out that I'm not necessarily advocating on their behalf or doing white PR, in, in contrast to black PR, in terms of I'm not the reclam in advertisement for this group, but in a political science model. They're both attractive and intriguing. Um, they are in the process of party formation, uh, they have one member who's a sitting independent member in the Armenian parliament. They have another veteran of the Nagorno-Karabakh war who should be running for the uh, mayoral uh, election for Armenia's fourth largest city. Um, and they're bolstered by professors, civil society activists, and young professionals. Um, enough of a cross-section to attract key cohorts, demographically, but also across the political spectrum. Um, and they are engaged in a regional process of outreach. In other words, unlike the usual politics in Georgia and Armenia, where everything's in Tbilisi, everything's in Yerevan, there is more of a grassroots emphasis, where the momentum, to be honest, will become so powerful that when and if the government realizes what's going on, it may be too late. Now the second question regarding Russia, what Georgia needs to pay more attention to is perhaps the danger of Eurasian Union becoming an instrument. In other words, the real leverage for Russia to work may not be peacekeepers in the Gorno Karabakh. It may be the decision to create a customs checkpoint between Armenia and Karabakh under the guise or justification of Eurasian Union membership. For Georgia, one of the dangerous trends that we both suffer from is if Russia pushes for a customs checkpoint on the Armenian-Georgian border, as well as our stake in this is not only our relationship, our need for a stable relationship with, with Georgia. But all of our bilateral trade with Turkey passes through Georgia, which is also important. But put aside the Eurasian Union. What's also important is Georgia's association agreement already creates a challenge for the Armenian government already in terms of the need to renegotiate and to uh, adapt and conform to changes in Georgian regulations and trade. That's an even more pressing challenge than the Eurasian Union. But to be honest, I'm rather skeptical that, uh, that Russia will actually um, succeed in provoking and promoting instability. Moreover, analytically, I could be very wrong, but I do expect a new period in Russia now, 
of retrenchment, of solidifying the near abroad, but looking at the Baltics as no longer the near abroad, and consolidating the gains, retrenchment for economic reasons. That's also why the timing of the Nemtsov assassination, the murder, may be actually the last preparatory step prior to a retrenchment. Um, good evening, thank you for being with us. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just remembering that Armenia was about to sign the association agreement uh, um, before, uh, before the country moved to Eurasian track. And we were observing the, these processes with the hub. And later, Armenian <coughs> president went to Moscow, and we know what happened. He declared, because of aforementioned reasons, Armenia cannot accept the deal with the European Union. Uh, considering the leverages uh, Russia had for that time over Armenia and Russia continues to have those leverages, was the choice uh, of the country and of the leadership of the country inevitable for that time? And what do you think? Uh, did Armenia avoid the Ukrainian scenario for, for that time? Although, don't forget, part of the Ukrainian scenario is actually a blessing in terms of the people actually protesting the government's choice. But in the Armenian, I don't know, but in the Armenian case, what's interesting is looking at the U-turn in policy. First, in terms of Armenia's U-turn, there are two important lessons learned. The first is for us, Armenian civil society. To be self-critical, that incident re revealed how lazy and complacent we were. After three and a half years of Armenia negotiating with the EU, in fact, they did a better job than the Georgians, to be honest. They were ready to initial the association agreement at Vilnius. The lesson learned, though, was after three and a half years of negotiations, we shouldn't have assumed that it was a done deal, that it would happen. And in fact, I was at the Vilnius summit. It was embarrassing. The second lesson learned is a criticism of the EU. The main criticism is there was never a clear communication strategy to articulate, to define, and defend the benefits of an association agreement in DCFTA for the ordinary citizen, the ordinary consumer of Georgia as well as Armenia. And we didn't put enough effort into that. That allowed Russia to win hearts and minds in a rather twisted portrayal of European values and ideals. In other words, we didn't adequately define what are European ideals and standards. It's not like the Georgian church argues. This isn't going to be chaos and too much freedom, rather, we didn't do enough. But what's important is the second point. Armenia's U-turn in policy did not happen in Yerevan first. It was a U-turn in Moscow, where very late in the game, the Russians all of a sudden drew a new line in the sand. Prior to that, they never opposed Armenia negotiating the association agreement. They took the European Union uh, they underestimated the European Union as a potential in engaging actor or rival. They also underestimated the ability of the Georgians, the Moldovans, and the Armenians, etc., to meet the requirements of the negotiations. But it was a decision to push out and to push back against European Union engagement. And the real change in Moscow was how the EU's association agreements all of a sudden became comparable to NATO expansion and unacceptable. The challenge now for the EU is to accommodate this new reality, to find a way forward. But what's also interesting, if we look at the Armenian case, let's be honest, the Armenian president was on a private visit to Croatia when he was summoned to Moscow. He was with his poker buddies, not his ministers or advisors. The day he went to Moscow, 
The Armenian Prime Minister at the time was in Yerevan defending the association agreement. In other words, it wasn't only the decision that bothered me. It was the way the decision was handled, where this was not a government-wide strategic shift. There was no analysis into the cost or benefit from such a move, and it was a done deal. What Russia seemed to have done was to take Sarsi on the side and to basically not necessarily twist his arm, but rather to imply that if Armenia went forward with the association agreement, then Russia would be forced to reconsider its security relationship with Armenia. And that was enough. Now, to be honest, I think Armenia should be criticized and not given an excuse. Oh, the poor Armenians, they have no choice. No. First of all, the weakness of Armenia was a result of Armenian policy mistakes. Armenia has much more value to Russia than it realizes. And Russia has much less value than Armenia realizes. At the same time, supposedly, the Armenians are famous for being good businessmen, clever. I don't see it anymore. I don't buy it. If they were, they would have negotiated and not surrendered. But yet, it gave in and gave up. In other words, why not offer observer status and not membership in the Customs Union, Eurasian Union, which wouldn't contradict the DCFDA Association Agreement? They didn't even try. The one example where Armenia said no to Russia was impressive. The Russians came to Armenia and said, we want you to recognize Abkhazia and South Ossetia. The Armenians couldn't say yet, couldn't say no, but what they said was, okay, we will, the day after you recognize the word Karabakh independence, knowing full well it wouldn't work. In other words, Russia is like Turkey. It only respects strength. Very good question, because it's nice to disagree respectfully. I don't see any likelihood of Iran becoming a leader in the region, just the opposite. From the Iranian perspective first, what it has in common with Armenia is a sense of isolation, and it needs a stable relationship with Armenia. But to be honest, that's changed. Iran is much less interested in Armenia recently, much more interested in Azerbaijan. The other driver is, from a US point of view, there's much more success in the US engagement with Iran than it appears. They are much closer to a deal and there are two casualties or victims from Western negotiations with Iran. Israel and Russia. And Russia is much less important in terms of Iran's imperative to normalize relations with the West. <laughs> 
That's also why the Caucasus is much less of a priority for Iran. I don't think they're as interested anymore because they need to re-enter and re-engage in the bigger world. The Caucasus is no longer a attractive alternative. Although Azerbaijani-Iranian relations are problematic and, and deep. Um, and in fact, that's more of the current government in Iran's uh, policy. From a Caucasus perspective, if that was from the Iranian perspective, for the Caucasus, let's be honest, Iran doesn't offer much today, but it could offer a lot tomorrow. To be honest, the bullshit answer I give when I'm asked this in Yerevan is, oh yes, Armenia is well positioned to be a bridge and a platform to engage Iran. Yeah, but the Armenians are like the Palestinians in the Caucasus. They never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> and in that context, I'm a little doubtful. The other problem is Armenian-Iranian relations are already limited to Russia. In other words, Russia does a lot to limit the development of Armenian-Iranian relations. What Russia doesn't interfere with, Armenian corruption does the job of limiting the development of relations. Now, in terms of a potential rival to Russia, there is one. It's not Iran. Believe it or not, it's Turkey. And despite the rather temporary marriage between Turkey or Erdogan's Turkey and Iran, it's, a, it's destined to return to its default position of rivalry. And in fact, I don't really see much of a future for Turkish-Russian relations. Um, and in fact, Turkey, whether it's the Black Sea or whether it's the broader region, once normalization with Armenia is accomplished, then could actually emerge more as a counter to Russia. And whether you're visiting Batumi or whether you're in Tbilisi, that's going to be important. Okay, one other thing that I want to add is I run an independent think tank in Armenia. Unfortunately, because I'm in Armenia, I also think a lot about tanks rather than just being a think tank. But we do have an email distribution list and we do a number of activities in Georgia, uh, not just the Bol Stiftung, but also Corneli Kachacha, Georgian Political Science Association, and some of your dinosaurs. Dinosaurs like Alex Rondelli, Giannodia, uh, you know, in many ways, we try to actually adopt a new model in Armenia, a teamwork approach in terms of going beyond personalities in politics or personalities in academia. Um, but feel free to offer, explore opportunities that we offer, from fellowship programs to internships to, all, to also specific project activities. And what great translation we have today. <laughs> To our host, not Heinrich Boll, but Malkas. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for the very interesting and fascinating discussion. I think that the both of the questions we agree with among each other, between each other, they were uh, answered, and there were more questions from the audience. Let me add one thing that's important I should have started with as a disclaimer. I was introduced a little bit incorrectly. I'm not an expert on anything. And actually, my wife would remind me of that. I'm an analyst, which also means that I could be as wrong as I am right. But the point is, critical analysis is sometimes lacking in our cultures and in our countries. But it's also good to be honest. Many from Armenia and Georgia love to talk sometimes without saying much. That's why I wanted to limit the lecture and focus more on the questions. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It was a pleasure to have you. And I hope you will have another